This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alan Davis Drake in Long Branch, New Jersey. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 17, Section C. How did the centripetal remainder afford egress to the centrifugal departer? By inserting the barrel of an originated male key in the hole of an unstable female lock, obtaining a purchase on the bow of the key, and turning its wards from right to left, withdrawing a bolt from its staple, pulling inward spasmodically an obsolescent unhinged door, and revealing an aperture for free egress and free ingress. How did they take leave, one of the other, in separation? Standing perpendicular at the same door, and on different sides of its base, the lines of their valedictory arms meeting at any point and forming any angle less than the sum of two right angles. What sound accompanied the union of their tangent, the disunion of their respectively centrifugal and centripetal hands, the sound of the peal of the hour of the night by the chime of the bells in the church of St. George? What echoes of that sound were by both and each heard? By Stephen Liliata ruti landlium, turma circumdent, e ubilentium te virginium, chorus excipiat. By Bloom Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. Where were the several members of the company with which Bloom that day, at the bidding of that peal, had travelled from Sandy Mount in the south to Glassenvin in the north? Martin Cunningham in bed, Jack Power in bed, Simon Dedalus in bed, Ned Lambert in bed, Tom Kiernan in bed, Joe Hines in bed. John Henry Menton, in bed, Bernard Corrigan, in bed, Patsy Dingham, in bed, Patty Dingham, in the grave. Alone, what did Bloom hear? The double reverberation of retreating feet in the heaven-born earth, the double vibration of a Jew's harp in the resonant lane. Alone, what did Bloom feel? The cold of intercellular space, thousands of degrees below freezing point, or the absolute zero of Fahrenheit, centigrade, or Réaumur, the incipient intimations of proximate dawn. Of what did bell chime and hand touch and footstep and lone chill remind him? of companions now in various manners in different places defunct, Percy Apjohn, killed in action, Muddy River, Philip Gilligan, Phthisis, Jervis Street Hospital, Matthew F. Kane, accidental drowning, Dublin Bay, Philip Moisel, Nemia, Hadesbury Street, Michael Hart, Thysis, Mater Misericordia Hospital, Patrick Dingham, Apoplexy, Sandy Mount. What prospect of what phenomenon inclined him to remain? The disparition of three final stars, the diffusion of daybreak, the apparition of a new solar disk. Had he ever been a spectator of those phenomenon? Once, in 1887, after a protracted performance of charades in the house of Luc Doyle, Kimage, he had awaited with patience the apparition of the diurnal phenomenon, seated on a wall, his gaze turned in the direction of Mizrach, the east. 
He remembered the initial paraphenomenon. More active air, a matutinal distant cock, ecclesiastical clocks at various points, avine music, the isolated tread of an early wayfarer, the visible diffusion of the light of an invisible luminous body, the first golden limb of the resurgent sun, perceptible low on the horizon. Did he remain? With deep inspiration he returned re-traversing the garden, re-entering the passage. With deep inspiration he returned, re-traversing the garden, re-entering the passage, re-closing the door. With brief suspiration he resumed the candle, reascended the stairs, re-approached the door of the front room, hall floor, and re-entered. What suddenly arrested his ingress? The right temporal lobe of the hollow sphere of his cranium came into contact with a solid timber angle where, an infinitesimal but sensible fraction of a second later, a painful sensation was located in consequence of antecedent sensations transmitted and registered. Describe the alterations affected in the disposition of the articles of furniture. A sofa, upholstered in prune plush, had been translocated from opposite the door to the ingle side near the compacted furled union jack, an alteration which he had frequently intended to execute. The blue and white checkered inlaid majolical topped table had been placed opposite the door in the place vacated by the prune plush sofa. The walnut sideboard, a projecting angle of which had momentarily arrested his ingress, had been moved from its position beside the door to a more advantageous but more perilous position in front of the door. Two chairs had been moved from right and left to the ingle side to the position originally occupied by the blue and white checker inlaid majolica topped table. Describe them. 1. A squat stuffed easy chair with stout arms extended and back slanted to the rear, which, repelled in recoil, had then upturned an irregular fringe of a rectangular rug, and now displayed on its amply upholstered seat a centralized diffusing and diminishing discoloration. The other. A slender splayfoot chair of glossy cane curves, placed directly opposite the former, its frame from top to seat and from seat to base being varnished dark brown, its seat being a bright circle of white plated rush. What significances attached to these two chairs? Significance of similitude, of posture, of symbolism, of circumstantial evidence, of testimonial supermanence. What occupied the position originally occupied by the sideboard? A vertical piano, Cadby, with exposed keyboard, its closed coffins supporting a pair of long yellow ladies' gloves and an emerald ashtray containing four consumed matches, a partly consumed cigarette and two discolored ends of cigarettes its music rest supporting the music in the key of g natural for voice and piano of love's old sweet song words by g clifton bingham composed by j l malloy sung by madame antoinette sterling open at the last page with the final indications ad libitum forte pedal animato sustained pedal Ritarando. Close. With what sensations did Bloom contemplate in rotating these objects? With strain, elevating a candlestick. With pain, feeling on his right temple a contused tumescence. With attention, focusing his gaze on a large, dull, passive, and slender, bright, active. With solicitation, bending and downturning the upturning rug fringe. With amusement, remembering Dr. Malachy Mulligan's scheme of color containing the graduation of green, 
with pleasure repeating the words and antecedent act and perceiving through various channels of internal sensibility the consequent and concomitant tepid pleasant diffusion of gradual discoloration his next proceeding from an open box on the majolica topped table he extracted a black diminutive cone one inch in height placed it on its circular base in a small tin plate placed his candlestick on the right corner of the mantelpiece produced from his wainscoat a folded page of prospectus illustrated entitled agendath natum unfolded the same examined it superficially rolled it into a thin cylinder ignited it in the candle flame applied it when ignited to the apex of the cone till the latter reached the stage of rudolence place the cylinder in the basin of the candlestick disposing its unconsumed part in such a manner as to facilitate total combustion what followed this operation the truncated conical crater summit of the diminutive volcano emitted a vertical and serpentine fume redolent of aromatic oriental incense what homeothetic objects other than the candlestick stood on the mantelpiece a timepiece of striated canemera marble stopped at the hour of four forty six a m on the twenty first march eighteen ninety six matrimonial gift of matthew dillon a dwarf tree of glacial arborescence under a transparent bell-shade matrimonial gift of luke and caroline doyle an embalmed owl matrimonial gift of alderman john hooper what interchanges of looks took place between these three objects and bloom in the mirror of the gilt-bordered pier-glass the undecorated back of the dwarf tree regarded the upright back of the embalmed owl before the mirror the matrimonial gift of alderman john hooper with a clear melancholy wise bright motionless compassionate gaze regarded bloom while bloom with obscure tranquil profound motionless compassionate gaze regarded the matrimonial gift of luke and caroline doyle what composite asymmetrical image in the mirror then attracted his attention the image of a solitary ipso relative mutable aliorelative man what solitary ipso relative brothers and sisters had he none yet that man's father was his grandfather's son why mutable aliorelative from infancy to maturity he had resembled his maternal procreatrix from maturity to senility he would increasingly resemble his paternal procreator what final visual impression was communicated to him by the mirror the optical reflection of several inverted volumes improperly arranged and not in the order of their common letters with scintillating titles on the two bookshelves opposite catalogue these books tom's dublin post office directory eighteen eighty six dennis florence mccarthy's poetical works copper beech leaf bookmark at page five shakespeare's work dark crimson morocco gold tooled the useful ready reckoner brown cloth the secret history of the court of charles the second red cloth tooled binding the child's guide blue cloth the beauties of killarney wrappers when we were boys by william o'brien m p greenish cloth slightly faded envelope bookmark at page two seventeen thoughts from spinoza maroon leather the story of the heavens by sir robert ball blue cloth ellis's three trips to madagascar brown cloth title obliterated the stark monroe letters by a conan doyle property of the city of dublin public library 106 capel street lent twenty first may 
with son Eve, 1904, due for June, 1904, 13 days overdue, black cloth binding bearing a white letter number ticket. Voyages in China by Viator Recovered with brown paper, red ink title. Philosophy of the Talmud, sewn pamphlet. Lockhart's Life of Napoleon, cover wanting, marginal annotations, minimalizing victories, aggrandizing defeats of the propagandist. Soul und Haben by Gustav Freitag. Blackboards, Gothic characters, cigarette coupon bookmark at page 24. Hosier's History of the Russo-Turkish War. Brown cloth, A volumes, with gummed label. Garrison Library, Governor's Parade, Gibraltar, in verso of cover. Lawrence Bloomfield in Ireland by William Allingham. Second edition, green cloth, gilt, trayfold design. Previous owner's name on recto of flyleaf erased. A handbook of astronomy. Cover, brown leather, detached S-plates. Antique letterpress, long primer. Author's footnotes, non pareil Marginal clues, breviere. Captions, small pica. The Hidden Life of Christ. Blackboards. In the Track of the Sun, Yellow Cloth, Title Page Missing, Recurrent Title Intestation, Physical Strength and How to Obtain It, by Eugene Sandow, Red Cloth, Short but Yet Plain Elements of Geometry, Written in French by F. Ignat, Parties and Rendered into English by John Harris, D. D. London, Printed for John Naplock at the Bishop's Head, MDCCXI, with dedicatory epistle to his worthy friend Charles Cox, Esquire, Member of Parliament for the Burg of Southwark, and having ink calligraphed statement in the flyleaf certifying that the book was the property of Michael Gallagher, dated this tenth day of May, 1822, and requesting the person who should find it, if the book should be lost or go astray, to return it to Michael Gallagher, Carpenter, Durfeygate, Anacorfe, County Wicklow, the finest place in the world. What reflections occupied his mind during the process of reversion of the inverted volumes? The necessity of order a place for everything and everything in its place, the deficient appreciation of literature possessed by females, the incongruity of an apple incunated in a tumbler and of an umbrella inclined in a clothes tool, the insecurity of hiding any secret document behind, beneath, or between the pages of a book. Which volume was the largest in bulk? Hosier's History of the Russo-Turkish War What among other data did the second volume of the work in question contain? The name of a decisive battle, forgotten, frequently remembered by a decisive officer, Major Brian Cooper Tweedy, remembered. Why, firstly and secondly, did he not consult the work in question? Firstly, in order to exercise pneumotechnic. Secondly, because after an interval of amnesia, when seated at the central table, about to consult the work in question, he remembered by mnemotechnic the name of the military engagement, Plevna. What caused him consolation in this sitting posture? The candor, nudity, pose, tranquility, youth, grace, sex, Council of a statue erect in the center of the table, an image of Narcissus purchased by auction from P. A. Wren, 9 Bachelor's Walk. What caused him irritation in this sitting posture? 
inhibitory pressure of collar size seventeen and waistcoat five buttons two articles of clothing superfluous in the costume of mature males and inelastic to alterations of mass by expansion how was the irritation allayed he removed his collar with contained black necktie and collapsible stud from his neck to a position on the left of the table he unbuttoned successively in reversed direction waistcoat trousers shirt and vest along the medial line of irregular incrustated black hairs extended in triangular convergence from the pelvic basin over the circumference of the abdomen and umbilical fossicle along the medial line of nodes to the intersection of the sixth pectoral vertebrae thence produced both ways at right angles and terminating in circles described about two equidistant points right and left on the summits of the mammary prominences he unbraced successively each of six minus one braced trouser buttons arranged in pairs of which one incomplete what involuntary actions followed he compressed between two fingers the flesh circumjacent to a cicatrice in the left infracostal region below the diaphragm resulting from a sting inflicted two weeks and three days previously twenty third may nineteen o four by a bee he scratched imprecisely with his right hand though insensible of prurition various points and surfaces of his partly exposed wholly obluted skin he inserted his left hand into the low low he inserted his left hand into the left lower pocket of his waistcoat and extracted and replaced a silver coin one shilling placed there presumably on the occasion seventeen october nineteen o three of the internment of mrs emily sinico sydney parade compile the budget for sixteen june nineteen o four debit one pork kidney three pence one copy freeman's journal one pence one bath and gratification one shilling sixpence tram fare one pence one memoriam patrick dingham five pence two banbury cakes one pence one lunch seven pence one renewal fee for book one shilling one packet note paper and envelopes two pence one dinner gratification two shillings one postal order and stamp two shillings eight pence tram fare one pence one pig's foot four pence one sheep's trotter three pence one cake fries plain chocolate one shilling one square soda bread four pence one coffee and bun four pence loan stephen dedalus refunded one pound seven shillings balance sixteen shillings sixpence credit cash on hand four shillings nine pence commission received freeman's journal one pound seven shillings sixpence loan stephen dedalus one pound seven shillings totals debit two pounds nineteen shillings three pence total credit two pounds nineteen shillings three pence did the process of divestiture continue sensible of a benign persistent ache in his foot soles he extended his foot to one side and observed the creases protuberances and salient points caused by foot pressure in the course of walking repeatedly in several different directions then inclined he disnoted the lace knots unhooked and loosened the laces took off each of his two boots for the second time detached the partially moistened right sock through the forepart which the nail of his great toe had again effaced raised his right foot and having unhooked a purple elastic sock suspender took off his right sock placed his unclothed right foot on the margin of the seat of his chair 
picked at and greatly lacerated the protruding part of the great toenail, raised the part lacerated to his nostrils, and inhaled the odor of the quick. Then, with satisfaction, threw away the lacerated ungual fragment. Why with satisfaction? Because the odor inhaled corresponded with other odors inhaled of other ungual fragments picked and lacerated by Master Bloom, pupil of Mrs. Ellis's juvenile school, patiently each night in the act of brief genuflection and nocturnal prayer and ambitious meditation. In what ultimate ambition had all concurrent and consecutive ambitions now coalesced? Not to inherit by right of primogeniture, gravel kind or borough English, or possess in perpetuity an excessive demands of a sufficient number of acres, roods and perches, statue land measure, valuation forty two pounds, of grazing tubery, surrounding a baronial hall with gate lodge and carriage drive, nor, on the other hand, a terrace house or semi detached villa, described as Rus and Herbe or Qui Sisana but to purchase by private treaty in fee simple a thatched bungalow-shaped two-story dwelling-house of southerly aspect surmounted by vane and lightning conductor connected with the earth with porch covered by parasitic plant ivy or virginia creeper hall door olive green with smart carriage finish and neat door brasses stucco front with gilt tracery on eaves and gable rising if possible upon a gentle eminence with agreeable prospect from balcony with a stone pillar parapet over unoccupied and unoccupiable interjacent pastures and standing in five or six acres of its own ground at such a distance from the nearest public thoroughfare as to render its house lights visible at night above and through a quick-set hornbeam hedge of tapiary cutting situated at a given point not less than one statute miles from the periphery of the metropolis within a time limit of not more than fifteen minutes from tram or train line e g dundrum south or sutton north both localities equally reported by trial to resemble the terrestrial poles in being favorable climates for physical subjects the premises to be held under fee farm grant lease nine hundred and ninety nine years the message to consist of one drawing-room with bay window two lancets thermometer affixed one sitting-room four bedrooms two servants rooms tiled kitchen with close range and scullery lounge hall filled with linen wall presses fumed oak sectional bookcase containing the encyclopedia britannica and the new century dictionary transverse obsolete medieval and oriental weapons dinner gong alabaster lamp bowl pendant vulcanite automatic telephone receiver with adjacent directory and tufted axminster carpet with cream ground and trellis border loo table with pillar and claw legs hearth with massive fire brasses and ormolu mantel chronometer clock guaranteed timekeeper with cathedral chime barometer with hygrographic chart comfortable lounge settees and corner fitments upholstered in ruby plush with good springing and sunk center three banner japanese screen and cuspidors club style rich wine-colored leather gloss renewable with a minimum of labor by use of linseed oil and vinegar a pyramidical prismatic central chandelier luster bentwood perch with finger tame parrot expurgated language embossed mural paper at ten shillings per dozen with transverse swags of carmine floral design and top crown fringe staircase three continuous flights at successive right angles of varnished clear-grained oak treads and risers newel balusters and handrail with step-up panel dado dressed with camphorated wax bathroom hot and cold supply reclining and shower 
water closet at mezzanine provided with opaque single panel oblong window tin up seat bracket lamp brass tear rod and brace armrests footstool and artistic oleograph in inner face of door ditto plain servants apartments with separate sanitary and hygienic necessities for cook general and between maid salary rising by biennial unearned increments of two pounds with comprehensive fidelity insurance annual bonus one pound and retiring allowance based on the sixty-five system after thirty years service pantry buttery larder refrigerator out to offices coal and wood cellarage with wine bin still and sparkling vintages for distinguished guests if entertained to dinner evening dress carbon monoxide gas supply throughout what additional attractions might the grounds contain as addenda a tennis and fives court a shrubbery a glass summer-house with tropical plants equipped in the best botanical manner a rockery with water spray a beehive arranged on humane principles oval flower beds in rectangular grass plots set with eccentric ellipses of scarlet and chrome tulips blue scillus crocuses polyanthus sweet william sweet pea lily of the valley bulbs obtained from sir james w mackey limited wholesale and retail seed and bulb merchants and nurserymen agents for chemical manures twenty three sackville street upper an orchard kitchen garden and vinery protected against illegal trespassers by glass-topped mural enclosures a lumber shed with padlocks for various inventoried implements as eel traps lobster pots fishing rods hatchet steel yard grindstone clod crusher swathe turner carriage sack telescope ladder ten tooth rake washing clogs hay tender tumbling rake bill hook paint pot brush hoe and so on what improvements might be subsequently introduced a rabbit tree fowl run a dovecoat, a botanical conservatory, two hammocks, ladies and gentlemen's, a sundial shaded and sheltered by laburnum or lilac tree, an exotically harmonically accorded Japanese tinkle gate bell affixed to left lateral gate post, a capricious water butt a lawn mower with side delivery and grass box, a lawn sprinkler with hydraulic hose what facilities of transit were desirable when city-bound frequent connection by train or tram from their respective intermediate station or terminal when country-bound velocipedes a chainless freewheel roaster cycle with side basket car attached or draught convenience a donkey with wicker trap or smart phaeton with good working solid angular cob roan gelding fourteen h what might be the name of this erigible or erected residence bloom cottage st leopold's flowerville could bloom of seven eccles street foresee bloom of flowerville in loose allwood garments with harris tweed cap price eight shillings sixpence and useful garden boots with elastic gussets and watering can planting aligned young fir trees syringing pruning staking sowing hayseed trundling a weed-laden wheelbarrow with excessive fatigue at sunset amid the scent of new-mown hay ameliorating the soil multiplying wisdom achieving longevity what syllabus of intellectual pursuits was simultaneously possible snapshot photography comparative study of religion folklore relative to various amatory and superstitious practices contemplation of the celestial constellations what lighter recreations outdoor garden and fieldwork 
cycling on level macadamized causeways, ascents of moderately high hills, natation in secluded fresh water, and unmolested river boating in secure weary or lycurical with kedge anchor, on reaches free from weirs and rapids, period of estivation. Vespertinal perambulation or equestrian circumprocession with inspection of sterile landscape and contrastingly agreeable cottagers' fires of smoking peat turves, period of hibernation. Indoor. Discussion in tepid security of unsolved historical and criminal problems. Lecture of unexpurgated exotic erotic lecture of unexpurgated exotic erotic masterpieces house carpentry with toolbox containing hammer all nails screws tin tacks gimlet tweezers bullnose plane and turn screw might he have become a gentleman farmer of field produce and livestock not impossibly with one or two stripper cows one pike of upland hay and requisite farming implements e g an end-to-end -end churn a turnip pulper etc what would be his civic functions and social status among the country families and landed gentry arranged successively in ascending powers of hierarchical order that of gardener groundsman cultivator breeder and at the zenith of his career resident magistrate or justice of the peace with a family crest and a coat of arms and appropriate classical motto semper paratus duly recorded in the court directory bloom leopold p m p p c k p l l d honoris causis Bloomville, Dundrum, and mentioned in court and fashionable intelligence, Mr. and Mrs. Leopold Bloom have left Kingstown for England. What course of action did he outline for himself in such capacity? A course that lay between undue clemency and excessive rigor, the dispensation in a heterogeneous society of arbitrary class incessantly rearranged in terms of greater and lesser social inequality of unbiased homogeneous indisputable justice tempered with mitigants of the wildest possible latitude but extractable to the uttermost farthing with confiscation of estate real and personal to the crown loyal to the highest constituted power of the land actuated by an innate love of the rectitude his aims would be the strictest maintenance of public order the repression of many abuses though not of all simultaneously every measure of reform or retrenchment being a preliminary solution to be contained by fluxion in the final solution the upholding of the letter of the law common statute and law merchant against all traversers in covine and trespassers acting in contravention of bylaws and regulations all resuscitators by trespass and petty larceny of kindlings of venville rights obsolete by desuetude all orotund instigators of international persecution all perpetuators of international animosities, all menial molesters of domestic conviviality, all recalcitrant violators of domestic connubiality. Prove that he had loved rectitude from his earliest youth. To Master Percy Apjohn at high school in 1880, he had divulged his disbelief in the tenets of the Irish Protestant Church, to which his father Rudolf Vereg, later Rudolf Bloom, had been converted from the Israelic faith and communion in 1865 by the Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews subsequently abjured by him in favor of roman catholicism at the epoch of and with a view to his matrimony in eighteen eighty eight to daniel magrain and francis wade in eighteen eighty two during a juvenile friendship terminated by the premature emigration of the former 
he had advocated during nocturnal preambulations the political theory of colonial e g canada expansion and the evolutionary theories of charles darwin expounded in the descent of man and the origin of species in eighteen eighty five he had publicly expressed his adherence to the collective and national economic program advocated by james finton layler john fisher murray john mitchell j f x o'brien and others the agrarian policy of michael davitt the constitutional agitation of charles stuart parnell m p for cork city the program of peace retrenchment and reform of william ewart gladstone m p for midlothian n b and in support of his political convictions had climbed up to a secure position amid the ramifications of a tree in northumberland road to see the entrance second of february eighteen eighty eight into the capital of a demonstrative torchlight procession of twenty thousand torch-bearers divided into one hundred and twenty trade corporations bearing two thousand torches in escort of the marquess of ripon and honest john morley how much and how did he propose to pay for his country residence as per prospectus of the industrious foreign acclimatized nationalized friendly state aid building society incorporated eighteen seventy four a maximum of sixty pounds per annum being one-sixth of an assured income derived from gilt-edged securities representing five per cent simple interest or capital of twelve hundred pounds estimate of price at twenty years purchase of which to be paid on acquisition and the balance in the form of annual rent viz eight hundred pounds plus two and a half per cent interest on the same repayable quarterly in equal annual installments until extinction by amateurization of loan advanced for purchase within a period of twenty years amounting to an annual rental of sixty four pounds head rent included the title deeds to remain in possession of the lender or lenders with a savings clause envisaging forced sale foreclosure and mutual compensation in the event of protracted failure to pay the terms assigned otherwise the message to become the absolute property of the tenant occupier upon expiry of the period of years stipulated what rapid but insecure means to opulence might facilitate immediate purchase a private wireless telegraph which would transmit by dot and dash system the result of a national equine handicap flat or steeplechase of one or more miles and furlongs won by an outsider at odds of fifty to one at three hours eight minutes p m at ascot greenwich time the message being received and available for betting purposes in dublin at two fifty nine p m dunsink time an unexpected discovery of an object of great monetary value precious stone valuable adhesive or impressed postage stamp seven shilling mauve imperforated hamburg eighteen sixty six fourpence rose blue paper perforate great britain eighteen fifty five one franc stone official roulated diagonal surcharge luxembourg eighteen seventy eight antique dynastic ring unique relic in unusual repositories or by unusual means from the air dropped by an eagle in flight by fire amid the carbonized remains of an, an incendiated edifice in the sea amid flotsam jetsam legan and derelict on earth in the gizzard of a comestible fowl a spanish prisoner's donation of a distant treasure of valuables or specie or bullion lodged with a solvent banking corporation one hundred years previously at five per cent compound interest of the collective worth of five million pounds sterling a contract with an inconsiderable contractee for the delivery of thirty-two consignments of some given commodity 
in consideration of cash payment on delivery per delivery at the initial rate of a farthing to be increased constantly in the geometrical progression of two farthing halfpenny one penny threepence fourpence eightpence one shilling fourpence two shillings eightpence to thirty-two terms a prepared scheme based on a study of the laws of probability to break the bank of monte carlo a solution of the secular problem of the quadrants of the circle government premium one million pounds sterling what vast wealth acquirable through industrial channels the reclamation of dunhams of waste aerial soil proposed in the prospectus by agonath natum Bleibstrustrasse, Berlin, West 15, by the cultivation of orange plantations and melon fields and reforestation, the utilization of waste paper, fells of sewer rodents, animal excrement possessing chemical properties, in view of the vast production of the first, vast number of the second, and immense quantity of the third every normal human being of average vitality and appetite producing annually cancelling by-products of water a sum total of eighty pounds mixed animal and vegetable diet to be multiplied by four million three hundred and eighty six thousand and thirty five the total population of ireland according to the census returns of nineteen o one were these schemes of wider scope a scheme to be formulated and submitted for approval to the harbor commissioners for the exploitation of white coal hydraulic power obtained by hydroelectric plant at peak of tide at dublin bar or at head of water at pulafoca or powers court or catamit basins of main streams for the economic production of fifty thousand w h p of electricity a scheme to enclose the peninsula delta of the north bull at dolly mount and erect on the space of the foreland used for golf links and rifle ranges an asphalted esplanade with casinos booths shooting galleries hotels boarding houses reading rooms establishments for mixed bathing a scheme for the use of dog vans and goat vans for the delivery of early morning milk a scheme for the development of Irish tourist traffic in and around Dublin by means of petro-propelled river-boats, plying in the fluvial fairway between steamers for coat-wise navigation, ten shillings per person per day, guide trilingual included. A scheme for the repristination of passenger and goods traffics over Irish waterways, when freed from weed-beds a scheme to connect by tram-line the cattle market north circular road and prussia street with the quays sheriff street lower and east wall parallel with the lynx line railway laid in conjunction with the great southern and western railway line between the cattle park liffey junction and terminus of the midland great western railway forty three to forty five north wall in proximity to the terminal stations at dublin branches of great central railway midland railway of england city of dublin steam packet company lancaster and northshire railway company dublin and glasgow steam packet company glasgow and dublin and londonderry steam packet company laird line british and irish steam packet company dublin and morcabe steamers london and north west railway company dublin port and dockets board landing sheds and transit sheds of palgrave murphy and company steamship owners agents for steamers from mediterranean spain portugal france belgium and holland and for liverpool underwriters association the cost of acquiring rolling stock for animal transport and of additional mileage operated by the dublin united tramway corporation limited to be covered by graziers fees positing what protasis would the contraction for such several schemes become a natural and necessary apodosis 
given a guarantee equal to the sum sought the support by deed or gift transfer vouchers during donor's lifetime or by bequest after donor's painless extinction of eminent financiers bloom pasha rothschild guggenheim hirsch montefiore morgan rockefeller possessing fortunes of six figures amassed during a successful life and joining capital with opportunity the thing required was done what eventually would render him independent of such wealth the independent discovery of a gold seam of inexhaustible ore for what reason did he meditate on schemes so difficult of realization it was one of his axioms that similar meditations or the automatic relation to himself of a narrative concerning himself or tranquil recollection of the past when practiced habitually before retiring for the night alleviated fatigue and produced as a result sound response and renovated vitality his justifications as a physicist he had learned that of the seventy years of complete human life at least two-sevenths viz twenty years are passed in sleep as a philosopher he knew that at the termination of any allotted life only an infinitesimal part of any person's desires had been realized as a physiologist he believed in the artificial placation of malignant agencies chiefly operative during somnolence what did he fear the committal of homicide or suicide during sleep by an aberration of the light of reason the incommensurable categorical intelligence situated in the cerebral convolutions what were habitually his final meditations of some one sole unique advertisement to cause passengers to stop in wonder a poster novelty with all extraneous accretions excluded reduced to its simplest and most efficient terms not exceeding the span of casual vision and congruous with the velocity of modern life End of chapter 17c chapter 17d the final part of chapter 17 continues